Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. It's the sound of Rakas, the Sumatran orangutan. He is sitting high up in the canopy of the Gunung Lusur National Park in northwest Sumatra, calling out to some of the 150 other orangutans that live in that protected rainforest. And Rakas is making headlines as the first documented animal to use medicinal plants to heal a wound. Isabel Laumer is a primatologist and cognitive biologist at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior in Germany. Isabel, hello. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. This is a fascinating story. Tell us about this specific orangutan. Yeah, so, I mean, we observe, um, since 1994, we already observe wild Sumatran orangutans at the Swag Balimbing Research Site. And, yeah, I mean, during our daily observations of the orangutans that inhabit the area, we noticed that the male orangutan, Rakus, had a facial wound. And we think that he probably got it during a fight with a neighboring male. I was looking at some, some images of it. I mean, it's kind of a big gash near his eye. Just describe what that wound looked like. Oh, it looked quite nasty. So I think it's probably, I mean, we have centimeters here, five centimeters times five centimeters. <laughs> and you think th that, that this came from a fight with another orangutan? Yes. So because we heard um, several long call battles earlier, um, you also heard the long call earlier. Lo a long call is a call that male orangutans utter to attract females and also this other function is to repel rivals. Mm. And when two, two males are long calling at each, each other, there is some tension going on and we heard several long call battles before. That's why we think that it's very likely that he was involved in a fight with another male and therefore got this facial wound. And so having been in the fight and being given this, this gash, what did he do to try to heal this wound? Yeah, so he was observed three days later feeding on a plant. And this plant is a liana, it's called Fibroria tinctoria, and he was feeding on it. And then at one point, I mean, I also have to say that they rarely feed on this plant. So we have feeding scans, and just in 0.3% of all of our 390,000 feeding scans, the orangutans in this area feed from this plant. So he, f he was observed feeding on, on, on the plant, and then at some point he stopped swallowing but continued chewing. And then he put his finger and applied the plant sap from his mouth repeatedly onto his facial wounds. And this went on for seven minutes, so back and forth, um, putting the plant sap on top of his facial wound. And then in the end, he even put the more solid plant matter out of his mouth and fully covered the entire wound so that um, it, it was fully covered with this green paste. And it looked like a, yeah, like a wound plaster. What did that do to the wound? Um, I mean, it's very likely that um, this plant, so that this was actually helping him in in uh, healing the wound, because this plant is a very potent plant species. It's also used in ethnomedicine, and it has um, quite potent anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, anti viral, anti-fungal properties, and it also is a pain-relieving substance. It has a pain-relieving substance in it as well, and it's also lowering fever. So we think that this definitely aided in uh, the fast healing process. So it only took um, four days until this facial wound was, was closed, and um, we, did, we couldn't see any signs of wound infection. Mm. When you saw the footage of this, what went through your mind? Oh, I, I got very, very excited. Um, I mean, so far, um, it was never observed that a wild animal is treating his or her own wound with a medical plant. So, yeah, so I was very excited. And I mean, it's known that um, chimpanzees, there's, there's one group of chimpanzees in Gabon, and they were observed um, catching flies from the air immobilizing them between their lips, and then they put those flies on top of wounds. But until now, the researchers have not been able to identify the species of flies. Mm. So no one knows until now if they have any medical properties or if the chimpanzees are just doing it and it might be a social behavior. So we don't know until this point. And therefore, the observation of Rakus um, repeatedly 
treating his wound with the plant sap um, for this extended amount of time. Um, that was extremely in exciting for us. How would Rakas have learned how to do this, that the plant would actually help, that this plant in particular would, would help the wound and that if he were to apply it in that way, that that could lead to a, a positive outcome? Hmm. I mean, so there are two options. So one could be individual innovation. So, I mean, it could be even, this could be even in the beginning accidentally that he accidentally touched with his finger with the plant sap on the facial wound. And since this plant has potent um, pain relieving substances in it, it, he could have felt an immediate pain release, which then caused him to repeat this behavior over and over because it simply felt good, you know. And um, so this could, could be one option. Um, and we don't know if it was maybe the first time observing it, him doing it. Maybe this was already the 10th, 15th time that he has done that. So we don't know at all. Um, so this is one option. And the other option is social learning. So it's possible because we know that Rakus is not from the SWAG research area. Um, orangutan males, when they are in puberty or during puberty, they disperse over wide distances to establish a new home range in another area. And Rakus is not from the area. So it's also possible that eventually even his uh, natal population, so his birth population, shows this type of behavior. And he could have learned it from his mother or from another orangutan and then later applied it himself when he was injured. Mm -hmm. So this is also possible because orangutans either learn through individual learning or also social learning. How does this fit in, this discovery fit in with what we already know? about primates and how, and how they operate, how they live? I mean, I mean, this study shows, um, at, at again, how, how similar we are to our closest relatives. So we share, for example, 97% of our DNA with orangutans. And this study just shows, again, how, how similar also, you know, behavior can be and um, how, how important it is also to protect these astonishing animals. I mean, they are all in critically endangered and it's extremely important to create more protected forest areas to preserve these, uh, yeah, these amazing animals. And, you know, with every orangutan that we lose, we also lose a lot of also individual behavior like that. I mean, we are doing these observations since 1994 and now it's the first time that we observed that. So that also shows that it's very, really vital and very important to also long-term observe great apes in their in the natural area. What do you love about them? I mean, you've, you've spent a long time studying them and anybody who has been near them will use that language that you have, that they're amazing, that they're incredible. What do you love about them? Oh, I mean, they are incredibly smart and um, also their emotional life is also pretty, very similar to us humans. So I um, recently also um, um, published a paper, for example, on playful teasing and humor. And we found that all four species of great apes show playful teasing that is in many forms comparable to teasing in, in human infants. That, that they have a sense so of they, humor. Yes. <laughs> Yes, so they do tease each other and um, they also laugh. So great apes also have um, a laugh, a laughter. And um, I mean, they can also, they also from the, from physical, physically, they can, you know, not only make tools, they can also innovate tools. Um, so they are incredibly smart. Which, which should, if nothing else, should motivate us to, to make sure that they're protected, <laughs> that the species are protected, but also the areas that they live in are protected. Yeah, that, that, is, that is extremely important for species survival. Isabel, this is really interesting. Glad to talk to you about it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks. Isabel Laumer is a primatologist and cognitive biologist at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior in Germany.